our thoughts, our states of consciousness really create our experience in life. And one of the stories that came to mind was um, the Tiger Swami, which is in Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi. And we're not going to read the whole story, but basically, if you know, Yogananda went around India uh, interviewing saints and sages, and um, there are some pretty miraculous things that he talks about in this book. But the best thing about Autobiography of a Yogi is not the fantastic, um, amazing experiences. It's the message behind all the experiences. All right, so this book serves as a great introduction to get people on the spiritual path. But if you read it just a little deeply, and you can see the messages he was trying to get across, everything that a yogi needs to know is in this book, if you pay attention. All right. And with the Tiger Swami, the reason I found this so useful is because the Tiger Swami started out, he said that he had a really feeble body. And if you remember in the story, he basically attacked and wrestled with giant Bengal tigers and beat them <laughs> with his bare hands. All right. And one of the things that he talks about in here is how that happened. And so I just want to read one quote from here first. Um, the Tiger Swami said that mind is the wielder of muscles. Mind is the wielder of muscles. The force of a hammer blow depends on the energy applied. The power expressed by man's bodily instrument depends on his aggressive will and courage. The body is literally manufactured and sustained by mind. Through pressures of instincts from past lives, strengths or weaknesses percolate gradually into human consciousness. They express as habits, which in turn manifest as a desirable or an undesirable body. Outward frailty is, has a mental origin. In a vicious circle, the habit-bound body thwarts the mind. If the master allows himself to be commanded by a servant, the latter becomes autocratic. The mind is similarly enslaved by submitting to bodily dictation. And he goes on to say, or Yogananda goes on to write, At our entreaty, the impressive Swami consented to tell us something of his own life. He said, My earliest ambition was to fight tigers. My will was mighty, but my body was feeble. An ejaculation of surprise broke me. It appeared incredible that this man, now with Atl Atlantean shoulders fit to bear, could ever have known weakness. He says, It was by indomitable, indomitable persistency in thoughts of health and strength that I overcame my handicap. I have every reason to extol the compelling mental vigor which I found to be the real subduer of royal Bengals. He started out feeble. And yet he had this desire, for some reason, to fight tigers. Okay. And he goes through the story and he fights the tigers, but the whole point of this story is that he realizes that it's nothing to fight tigers. The true um, test of a person comes from subduing those tigers which are within our minds. And so these, these, these creatures within our minds, these habits, these tendencies, they will keep you locked in a particular experience so long as you give them power and energy over you. And you can know what those are by taking some time every day to pay attention what are the thoughts you are habitually thinking about yourself. If you want to accomplish something, if you want to experience something, if you want to know something, and you say that to yourself, and then in the back of your mind you have all these reasons why you can't, and you can come up with any reason you want, that's the indication that you've got some overcoming to do with these mental tigers. And so last night during the, um, the devotional chanting, there was one point in the meditation where I recommended for, um, for the participants to bring up in their mind like a virtue, whether it be wisdom or love or peace, whatever it might be, to bring that up into their minds. And as they breathe, to feel as though they were imbuing their body with that sense of wisdom, love, peace, just one. And so much identify with it that they weren't aware of anything else. And usually when people do something like this, what happens is they'll bring up a feeling of, let's just say, wisdom. And they'll bring it up and it just doesn't feel right. They just don't feel wise. They feel like a little person who's trying to figure stuff out and it's not working because the mind doesn't have that capacity and on and on and on. And so when you start to hold a virtue or a quality within you and it just doesn't feel right, it doesn't mean you don't have it. It means that you're not given it enough force, enough energy to truly manifest it. And so what you do is by your will, by your persistence, by prayer, whatever it might be, you give so much attention to it that you know nothing else. And it's not always easy, but if you stick with it, it eventually comes to bear.
it eventually comes out within a person. Okay. And so on the spiritual path, um, when we come to it, we think we need all these things, these particular techniques, that one right teacher, whatever it might be, to make all of this work. Any of those things are helpful. But we have to look at is what's in our mind that keeps us from just accepting that we can experience it. All right. If you want to build a house and you don't have it out there yet, you don't say, well, I want to build a house, but it's not already there, so obviously it's pointless to even try. You have the mind, you have the mind, think of it first, and then you go through the steps to make it come to life. All right. You can have the willpower, but you also have to have um, the commitment and the understanding that there are steps in the process. Okay. And a lot of times we forget what we've done in the past. So he talks about, through pressures of instincts from past lives, Strengths or weaknesses percolate gradually into human consciousness. Now, we're forgetful. We don't remember all the things that we put into play all the time. So, for example, let's say, again, this house building activity. Let's say you want to build a house, but you have to level the land first. Okay. So you've talked to a contractor last week about leveling the land, and now you forgot about that. Now you're talking to an architect, and he's coming out, and you know, he's going to build this house, talking about what you can do here, and he starts talking about the land. But then these people who are going to level the land show up and start plowing things over, which completely changes the way the architect sees that he's going to do here. And she's like, what's going on here? And so, so on. You keep going. You make all these plans, but you need to get them all lined up so they're together so it's in a step-by-step -step process. Does that make sense? And you've got to remember what you've done before. And this is one reason why, for example, a journal might be helpful. If you... Um, in your spiritual practice, if you have this idea that, let's say, um, let's say you really want to experience a sense of uh, peacefulness in your relationships, um, light in relationships, enjoyment in the relationships, and you write that down, this is what I want to experience. And so you decide that every day you're going to meditate on feeling peace, joy with whoever you interact with. You're trying to create that field within you, and you do that, but then you go out in the world and you start talking to the people that you're usually talking to, and they immediately push your buttons, and all of a sudden you start reacting in your habitual ways. And so in that particular instance, you're just counteracting what you've been doing in meditation. So part of the process isn't just the mental meditation, planning, will. It's also when you go out into the world, how are you, how are you living to support that with spiritual growth? If you want to know God, if you want to know the divine, well, God and the divine is here in everyone and everything. So you don't really need to get to know it. You just have to sort of admit it that it's there. So in meditation, you sit there and you say, I'm going to really feel God today. I'm really going to, no matter what happens, I'm going to know that I am in this divine consciousness. And you do that, and it feels great. And it lasts for about an hour. But then things start to go funky again. And now you're like, this isn't God. God wouldn't do this to me. But you see, what you're doing is you're going back into these old patterns. So even when you go back into the old patterns, you have to maintain, this is God too. It might not change it immediately, but still, you are affirming it. And then as time goes by, you affirm, this is God too, whatever it might be. And even though it seems at the time that whatever negative thing is out there, you're admitting this is God too, the mind is going to tell you that what you're doing is you're affirming that this negative aspect is God, and so you have to accept that. But that's not what's happening. You're going beyond the mind, and you are affirming that this is God too which allows you to relax, to trust, to be at peace. And the more that you can relax and trust and be at peace, even in the um, face of negative circumstances, what happens is consciousness starts to realize that it's more important for you to be relaxed and at peace. And so gradually, ever so slightly, things change. The things which bugged you before, bug you a little bit less. The people that came into your circle that sort of tweaked you a little bit, they become a little more for some weird reason, a little more pleasant. It's a gradual process. You just have to keep it in your mind and trust, right? So that's what this is all about. And so for this, for this particular, um, for this particular um, quote, I want to read it one more time. The mind is the wielder of muscles. The force of a hammer blow depends on the energy applied. The power expressed by man's bodily instrument depends on his aggressive will and courage. The body is literally manufactured and sustained by mind. Through pressure of instincts from past lives, strengths or weaknesses percolate gradually into human consciousness. They express as habits, which in turn manifest as a desirable or an undesirable body. Outward frailty has a mental origin in a vicious circle. The habit-bound body thwarts the mind. If the master allows himself to be commanded by a servant, 
the latter becomes autocratic. The mind is similarly enslaved by submitting to bodily dictation. And so he's talking about physical things here. But what we have to remember is the body is really our life, all the things that we experience. And this idea of um, aggressive will and courage, <clears throat> we don't want to be violent about it. But we have to remember that as, as expressions of this divine consciousness, as expressions of God here, there's a reason we have will and courage. You know, There's a reason that uh, people in the military are the way they are. There's a reason that bosses are the way they are. They get things done, right? <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that because we need things to get done. And so part of what we're learning to do is to become, to become that, that master, that general of our own consciousness. That way, when we need to change something, it changes. You know, I've told the story before. Um, one day when I was having a particularly fantastic day, I thought it was wonderful, everything was going great. <clears throat> and then the next day, things went really wrong. The phones wouldn't work. People were telling me that certain bills weren't paid when I know I paid them. Clients were calling at the wrong time. Everything went wrong. And so I thought, well, it'll pass. And then the next day I woke up, and it started happening again. <laughs> things were going bad. And what immediately came into my mind was, no, this is not happening today. This is not happening today. I just said that. I said it with force, and I said it with power. And I meant it. <laughs> and, when, <laughs> and oddly enough, immediately after that, my phone started working again. You know, my emails, I found the emails I needed. So the way you think, the way you feel, I'm not saying be violent about this process, but I am saying you need to be persistent and you need to be diligent. And don't be... Don't, don't play like a victim role or a, I can't do this or I'm not strong enough because what are you affirming when you say that? I can't do it, you know. The world is just not set up for this to work right. You are affirming that experience. And we have to remember that everyone has a different experience. So all of us here have had different experiences in life. Some of us have had experiences which repeat themselves consistently. Okay, Some people have fantastic health. They're always strong. They're always vigorous. I've had to work at it. What's the difference? For them, it was natural. For me, it took work. Same thing. What you're trying to do is you're trying to live in such a way, to affirm in such a way, to be confident in such a way that those things that you want to experience are just as natural as me saying my hair's brown. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to think about it. I just know it. And the mind will tell you, but you really have to struggle and strive and strain. And if you believe the mind a lot, you might have to do that for a while until eventually you realize that, no, I just have to kind of know that that's the case. And then you move beyond the mind, and then you move into like uh, the creative intelligence, which allows our bodies to work and life to function just effortlessly, which allows you to drive here without thinking about it, or just make a certain move, you know, like just reaching out and grabbing a book. You didn't think about it, you just picked it up. You know? It's that kind of thing that we're trying to work at here, getting into it so natural. So when you meditate, when you first sit down to meditate, don't think it's going to be hard think that this is going to be a great opportunity and you're going to find out so much about yourself. You're going to give your awareness to God. You're going to give your awareness to the divine, to peace. And that's what you're affirming. And you're doing that because you said you're doing it. And then as you sit there, the things that come up that bring up doubts or fears or mental things which, which confuse you, that's just showing you what you need to get rid of. So you don't say, but I've got all this. You say, oh, well, that's what I need to get rid of. I need to get rid of this thought that I can't experience God. I need to get rid of this thought that I can't experience peace. You need to get rid of these thoughts. That way, you can sit there and be at peace, and you can experience it. And then if you like, when you're done, you can project it further into the future, into life, seeing it happen, seeing its possibilities. And then when you're done, you get up, you go about your life, and you just say, all right, now that I've done this, what's it going to be like? How are things going to be different? You don't have an expectation about what's going to be different because your expectations are just going to screw you up a little bit. You say, how is it going to be different? What am I going to experience now? And then you affirm, whatever the changes have occurred, I'm willing to work with those too. You get to that space, you stay there, it's going to alter your outer life, but you need to see how is it going to alter your outer life. And then you go into the outer life and you just say, all right, well, I can deal with this now too. And then gradually as you go, you get clearer, things get easier. doesn't mean you're always going to have perfect days, but it means that you're going to be able to handle those days when they come.